This is The Writing Life. I'm Stephen W. Long. And uh, in full disclosure, my, my guest is uh, also a good friend, uh, Doug Cruikshank, Professor Emeritus of Education from Linfield. And, yes. But you've, you've taught many places, if I'm correct. Well, to, at the college level, just at Temple University okay. and uh, Linfield. Okay. But, but you've, you've been overseas and... I'm trying to remember the history. Didn't you teach in China? I taught in China, I taught yeah. in England. Okay. Uh, for a, a semester, a year actually. Okay. And uh, and taught a semester in China. Okay. It just sounds so exotic. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're here to talk about your book. Uh, this is a little bit, a little bit different in that uh, you you wrote parts of it, but it, to a great extent, it's an, it's an assemblage. Yes. So can you, well, maybe back up even from that. What are the circumstances under which the, the material was gathered well, or, or produced, I guess? Sure. Uh, it, it's a memoir of the, of the winter back country of Oregon. And for about 15 years, uh, Dren and Hamby uh, from Linfield and, and I uh, partnered and led a, a group of students, a, a small group, a group of uh, 10 to 14 students uh, to the, uh, out into the winter back country in the Three Sisters Wilderness area, mm -hmm. uh, Crater Lake, uh, Steens Mountain area, and uh, spent about three and a half weeks uh, kind of teaching the students uh, how to live comfortably in the winter back country, a little bit about uh, uh, the environment and the physics and chemistry of of snow and what snow does oh, and avalanches and <clears throat> so it's a so it's it's a look back on uh, all of those years uh, and and the kind of events that occurred during that uh, time we were out. Okay. Now, was it a part of this experience to journal, or did the, is that sort of spontaneous? Well, I journaled every year. Yeah. The last four years of the program, we had a group journal. So each night, one person would take that journal and write down their impression of the day okay. or some expression of the day, and then they would pass it to another person for the next night. Okay. So this, these entries in the journal uh, were widely varied. Some were just descriptive of what we did. Mm -hmm. Some were poetry. Some were song lyrics. Huh. Some were f uh, pictures they drew. So it was a, oh, really? okay. a wide variety of, of ways they expressed what was going on uh, that okay. day. Now, but... So did the book come from those four years, or is it more than that? Well, the book came from all, f all 15 years. Okay. My daughter was on the trip early on. She kept a journal. I have her journals, and I've used those. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've used mine primarily for the earlier times. And the last four years are a prepon preponderance of the journal entries. Yeah. You know... Um, well, there's so many little things I want to get to. Uh, talk about the title. Uh, where did that come from? Between Me and Comfort um, is, is the title. And it was a poem written by one of the students uh, on one of our trips. And uh, I could read part of that. Yeah, if you would, that'd be great. Uh, sure. It was, uh, it was quite a, a well-done poem. And... When I asked him about using it in the book, uh, he'd forgotten that he'd even written it. Oh. And so I had to uh, convince him that it was his work. And so oh, even after you exposed him to it, he didn't remember. Exactly. I, I oh sent gosh. him a copy and I said, did you write this? And yeah. he said, 
I don't think so. <laughs> and then I wrote back and said, several people said you did write it. And, uh, and then he sent me a note back and said, you know, there's a reference to Plato in it. And I was thinking Plato when I was in college. So maybe I did write it. Okay. I said, David Herbertson, you wrote it. Uh -huh. And he said, I said, may I use it? <laughs> and he said, sure. Okay. Yeah. So here's what it is. <clears throat> My ski broke and the mountain laughed at me. My feet froze and my dinner got cold, and the mountain stood in motion. She moves too slow to see, but her belly moves up and down in perfect rhythm. Her hearty laugh will still be singing out loud after the dreams fade from my eyes. Winter is what happens between me and comfort. Mm. Pride, vanity, and lack of wisdom is what comes between me and perfect vision. Try as I might to avoid it, I still think that everyone is me. I also think that the mountain has a voice and birds sing inspired by some strange overdose of joy. I can't help if my lines extend to the world and due to a lack of contrast or a spell of color blindness, I can't differentiate. I haven't lost myself. I misplaced the world. You know what strikes me about that? So this person who wrote this at the time, I'm assuming they were 20, 21. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound to me like I couldn't have done that at 21. I guess let me let me oh. say it like that. That's that's pretty profound. It is profound. Yeah. yeah. And that and just <clears throat> that winter is what comes between me and comfort. Just yeah. bounced right out at me. Oh, yeah. And when we were kind of setting this up, I was thinking, is, was there some criteria for the people who could apply for this? How, how, how did they get picked? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's, there's a lot of self-selection. Okay. Uh, most of the, of the students who had been on the trip had told their friends. Their friends then uh, decided that maybe they would like to try it. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were a group that uh, seemed to want to be out. And so they weren't shy about that. So we well, set wanted to be outdoors. I wanted to be outdoors. Okay. Right, right. And so we set up some interviews. We interviewed every student. Um, and not every student who applied was able to get in the program. Uh, so we did have criteria. And we wanted people who were willing to learn, who seemed to be flexible. Uh, they didn't have to have skiing experience. Mm -hmm. They would they would learn how to ski mm -hmm. very, very quickly, and uh, so we interviewed them and and selected them, and by and large we we did pretty well. You know, mm -hmm. We got a, a good group of students who who then the next year would come back and say to, to their friends, mm -hmm. "You need to go out." Right. And y you know, I've read the book. Very enjoyable. And uh, I hadn't thought about this until this moment, that this unit of people is, uh, at some point, you're relying on each other. And uh, did you ever have a student or a time that somebody, when it was too late to change your mind, clearly didn't fit or was c kind of a problem? We did. In fact, uh, <clears throat> we, you know, we called that <clears throat> Excuse me. Expedition behavior. And expedition behavior was the kind of uh, behavior the students had to have in order to survive, to get along with each other, mm -hmm. to, to make progress, and to be persistent. And we did have a, a, a man, a young man named John. Uh, John s seemed pretty full of himself at the beginning, mm -hmm. and and we went along pretty well for the first week or so, and we took a short four-day trip uh, to the top of the McKinsey Pass, and it was cold that night. It was eight degrees in the morning, some number like that, and he, he had... He was paired with two young women as part of his 
tent group. So the tent and cooking groups were were students of groups of about three. And the two young women in his tent group uh, had gotten up and made breakfast and and said, John, it's time for breakfast. Come on out. And John must have liked uh, the warm sleeping bag. And, and uh, so he just stuck his hand out the tent with a bowl, uh, asking, kind of asking them to fill it. And they were very nice to him, and they filled it. And that's not what I would have done, but that's what they did. And so that was kind of a little twist. And the next morning, they again got up, and, and, but he was carrying the food for them. And so he said, they said, John, do you have the granola? And he said, no, I don't have the granola. And they said, well, we thought you were carrying it. No, no, I, I don't have it. I, I don't know where it is. And so they found some other food and, and made kind of a tough meal and ate it. And, and the next day, we went back to, the, to our base camp, which was Lynn Cabin, which was a cabin not far from Sisters. Mm -hmm. And he went into the cabin after it was a it was a pretty tough ski back to the cabin, uh, seven or eight miles, and he went in and flopped down on the couch in the cabin by the fireplace and sat there. And the rest of the group had to unpack. Well, they unpacked the, and they got dinner ready and they started doing stuff. And finally, he got up from the couch and he started to unpack his pack and all of a sudden he says, oh, here's the granola with kind of a smile on his face, mm -hmm. which did not go over well right. with his tent partners. And it was within about uh, 24 hours when he came to us and said, I really uh, think I don't want to continue this trip. Mm -hmm. uh, the three or four day trip out was about all I could handle, and we were going to go on a 10-day trip out. And he, he didn't feel like he was wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. so, we'd, so all of us got together, and we skied out with him to Sisters, which was a pretty long ski. And at some point on that skiing out, uh, we were all skiing in line, and a girl right ahead of him fell. It's very easy to fall when you're on cross-country skis with a pack. Sure. Uh, it's very easy to fall over, and we did it. We all did it a lot. And so she fell right in front of him, and he just turned his skis and went around her and went on and didn't say, are you okay? Right. Can I help? Help her up. Yeah. And so <clears throat> that was just a kind of an explanation point on that whole right. episode. Well, that's telling, but you did this 15 years, mm -hmm. and so 15 times 14 kids or 10 kids or whatever it is, was that the only time? I, what I'm saying is, g given a big group of people, maybe that's statistically not so bad. No, no, it wasn't. Yeah. And, and I think that, the, you know, part of it was a, the choice of the students that went. Right. And, and having them know what to expect when they were going to be out. And uh, so that it, that was it only happened once. Yeah. But it was a good example of what expedition behavior is not. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. I, 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 when I've been thinking about this, ostensibly this is about um, outdoor skills. Mm -hmm. And I think you said the environment. But really it's so much more than that. And I hadn't thought about this aspect of it, but it's interpersonal relationships. How do the girls or the whole group or, or whatever, how do they treat this guy? I mean, I, th there is a way that they did treat him, but maybe that's an opportunity to learn how in a tough situation, uh, maybe in business. Uh, you sort of encountered this earlier in college. Now I've got this coworker and they're acting, they're not supportive. Now I know because I've been exposed to it, now I know how to act. Well, we found a little bit of that. Uh, one of the, as I was reaching out to people who were on the trip uh, and asking them about um, some journal entries, 
uh, one of the fellows uh, from Portland said, you know, there's a lesson that I learned <laughs> on, your, on the trip. Yeah. And I use it now in my work. Yeah. And, uh, and he kind of told what that was. And, and I, I thought, well, you know, and, and Susan Hyde, who wrote, the, who wrote uh, a piece for the back cover and, and spoke it during the commencement address at Linfield oh, last really? year. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, I didn't know she was going to do that, but I, I went over and met her, and she said, I'm going to say something about our trip. And, and so uh, she talks about uh, the, the kind of experiences she's had that made her a better person. Right. Uh, in life. What a great segue, because I want to read something. And, and there, at, at the end of the book, there's some very short one-sentence excerpts or something. And one of them that struck me was, <clears throat> I think being tough is a lot more than physical strength. It's also the ability to have patience with yourself and shrug off frustration. So that's, there's a, a you know, a, the lesson of perseverance, maybe, and that's the, the mental part. But I was thinking that I've heard about uh, fellows who are special forces, Green Beret or whatever. And when you meet them, they tend not to be the Hollywood version. They tend not to be particularly muscular or strapping or maybe handsome, or, but they have a mental toughness. And I think maybe that's <clears throat> in part what you were teaching. I think so. And, yeah. and, uh, and on those days when it was tough, uh, we found the students, even, you know, even the students who would shed a tear or two. Sure. Because the going was so tough. Uh, once they got settled and once they got into camp and built a camp and put a kitchen in, mm -hmm. put a tent up and had some food, <laughs> got a lot better. Got a lot better. And did did you, uh, when you did that, was it one night? Did you do that every day? Or did you make a camp and stay there and maybe make exploratory trips? And By and large, we, we kind of moved. But we would spend, uh, particularly the, the, the first outing, we had two outings. One was a short three or four day outing. <clears throat> where we pretty much stayed in the same place. Okay. The next one was a seven to ten day outing when we moved because we had to go from one spot to another. Mm -hmm. um, on the first one, we were able to teach skills that might come in handy. For example, building a Quincy. I was going to ask you about yeah, that. Which is a, is a snow shelter. Uh, it's not an igloo. It's not an igloo. Okay. No, it, it, it's a, it's a, it takes several hours to make one. <clears throat> and f starting with getting shovels, big grain shovels, and piling snow uh, up to about the level of six or seven feet high really? with, with a student or two or me uh, with skis on it, stomping it down, mm -hmm. making a, a solid mound, mm -hmm. and, then, and then leaving it. And letting it harden up. So after how long? Oh, three or four hours. Okay. So we would get one started, or two started, and then we would go off and ski, mm -hmm. ski, find some good hills to ski down. Then we'd come back and we'd hollow it out basically. So we would dig down a couple of feet, four feet, and we'd go underneath and we would hollow that out, leaving about 18-inch walls, mm -hmm. and poking a couple of air holes in it because you got to have some ventilation in those things. And, uh, and then we would sleep in those. You could put about three students in them. Okay. Uh, so seven feet tall, sort of, how big around? It was probably 10 or 12 feet across. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I read in here, wasn't there an incident where fellow woke up and heard water dripping and thought, because I guess they'd been told, well, the, you know, you breathe out and there's condensation and so on, and that collects, and, but, he, but this was more than that. This was more than that. And, and of all the Quincy's we built, and we must have built 25 or 30, 
uh, they were very, very strong. And at the end of, usually at the end of each camp, we would all get on top of one and jump up and down. And we couldn't collapse them oh, because boy. It, it has that arch the in it. The dome, yeah. But in this particular case, uh, we, we were in a storm and we were getting a strong wind and rain, warm rain. Oh, geez. And it, it <laughs> basically eroded sure. the top of it and it collapsed inside in into those students who were sleeping. Yeah, on, onto and, one of them, yeah. yes. yeah. And, uh, and, and they were frightened, and reasonably they should be. But they came out and notified us that uh, we were asleep, uh, told us what had happened, and, and immediately they were assigned to a tent and, mm -hmm. and went in and spent the night. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next day we dried out their equipment and it was fine. Okay. Um, his story of it is pretty dramatic. Uh -huh. And my story of it is just telling what happened. And, uh, is it the difference? I mean, it could be ages. It could be uh, he was in it and you weren't. Uh, well, I'm sure it was he was in it yeah. and, I, and I wasn't. Yeah. And I was just trying to describe, describe it right. in kind of objective terms. Uh, and, and I like the contrast between his his uh, dramatic uh, display of it and, sure. and mine. Would, and this brings me to something else that, that I thought throughout this, and that is uh, we could have a tragedy walking down 3rd Street in the summer. If so, something can always happen. This seems like the occasion for uh, danger is m more present. Did you ever feel that? Did you, did you feel that these could really be dangerous situations, or are they really, you know, you're cold, it's uncomfortable, but you know, we'll just hike back and it'll be fine. Well, safety was number one yeah. concern for us the whole time. And so we tried to find places that were safe and travel in places that were safe. And if we thought there was a danger, mm -hmm. like uh, for avalanche. an avalanche, yeah. Uh, then we took the precautions of skiing uh, in a way that if an avalanche would occur, not everybody would get buried in mm -hmm. the avalanche. And, there would, and we all carried avalanche transceivers mm. uh, all the time we were out. And, so if there were, and we learned how to use them. And so, we, yeah, we, were, we, we, we tried to be safe. Now, there was only one time that I was a little nervous. Uh, it was a, a day we had left Park Meadow and we're heading over toward Green Lakes through the through a pass between Broken Top and the South Sister, and it was it was kind of clear in the morning, and we thought, well, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And we got about one o'clock in the afternoon. We got uh, up on the on the slope up toward the the pass and. It's, it was snowing, it was uh, white out conditions, it was foggy, it was, it was just, you couldn't see. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we, and we were using compasses at that time to find our way, and we had, but had no reference to use the compass with, so it became very difficult. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at some point, maybe 2.30 or 3 in the afternoon, uh, we just weren't seeing what we wanted to see. We couldn't see much anyway, but we couldn't, we weren't where we wanted to be. So we stopped and backed off about a quarter mile and set up camp in a, among different tree wells that were, that were spaced around. The trees were all dead. And so each cooking group and each tent group um, had a tree well and we, so we dug out kitchens and set up tents and uh, went to bed and it was blowing pretty hard that night and the next morning we woke up and it was a perfectly clear day. Beautiful, mm -hmm. sunny, beautiful day. As soon as we looked out the tent door, we knew where we were. We, knew ex we, j we said, oh, we're, we want to be over there okay. and not here. Were you far off from where you thought we were you were? About a mile, okay. yeah, about a mile. But, a mile's not too much. And, right. 
Uh, so, but, but the thing is, we, we always had food, we always had shelter, mm -hmm. we always had shovels, we always had water because we melted snow for water, we, mm -hmm. all had, we had cooking equipment. So we always had what we needed and there was not a real, you know, there was no real problem. Mm -hmm. It was just that when it gets, when it gets white out conditions, it's very difficult to make much progress. So I'm thinking of a couple things. One is, and you, you mentioned that stuff and you'd mentioned the, the shovels earlier, you know, to make the Quincy. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff you're carrying, right? Yes. I, I mean, do, do, is there a sled or? Well, we had, each of us had a, a backpack. Okay. Backpacks weighed 40 to 50 pounds. And then we had f about four sleds. Oh, okay. Uh, and each sled would hold about 50 pounds. And the sleds generally carried the cooking gear, carried the tents, carried the, the gasoline and the stoves that we used. Uh, so that was the, the weight and the food mm -hmm. uh, were all in the sleds. And the sleds were very hard to pull, uh, particularly if the snow was fresh and deep. Right. And so we would trade off. Uh, the, there were the each tent group had a sled, and so there were three three students in the tent group, and so after one student would haul it for a mile, three quarters of a mile, mm -hmm. they would trade off, mm -hmm. and so over the day we got uh, we made progress with that. Okay. When we were in deeper snow, <coughs> we had. All of the students who weren't carrying uh, or pulling sleds would break trail, and the sleds would come behind. Mm -hmm. The first person with a sled, however, would have a pretty tough go because the, we'd have two tracks, and the, and the sled would still push the snow on, in the area between the two tracks. Right. Uh, yeah, the sleds made it uh, very doable. Okay. I don't want to run out of time. You've got uh, another uh, passage to read. Well, I do. This is uh, a passage that was written on a trip we took uh, to around Crater Lake. Okay. We had previously gone around Crater Lake two other times. It's about 35 miles. Uh, no snowmobiles can go around in the winter, so you're pretty much on your skis and alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third time, uh, we started out and we got into a storm, mm. uh, a, a blizzard that lasted for five days. Uh, it caused us to, after the first day and a half, to stop, set up the camp and sit and wait out the storm. Mm -hmm. We never saw the lake. We never got around the lake that year. Okay. Uh, we came back. But this young man, Robert was writing uh, just on the second day of that trip, and he tells about his day. So at seven o'clock, it says, the sound of, oh, beep, 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 the sound of my watch's alarm is almost imperceptible, but my keen ears pick out the sound of this sound of civilization through the thick layers of clothes and the fluffiness of my bag. I awake, but I am not excited to test the temperature outside of my snugly pleasure dome of a sleeping bag. I poke my hand out first and the cold bites it <laughs> like an angry badger. At 10.30 a.m., I stand with my skis two feet deep in the snow and look back to see 13 people loaded for bear and ready to fight through a heavy snowfall. 12.30 p.m., I am wet and cold and have lost the desire to plow through the snow in search of a goal that I will never see, I have never seen. What is this sun notch that I can, I can see on a map? I see no sun ahead, and I need a much bigger space than a notch to set my tent up. At 1.30 p.m., the order is given to find a home. This phrase is usually saved for shouting at stray dogs and feral cats, but is music to my ears. Hmm. I quickly find a place to pitch a tent and can only keep my frozen fingers moving long enough to tie a few taut line hitches before I must change my wet clothes, don my puff suit, and jump into my bag to fight off the early shivers of hyperthermia. It's 7 p.m., 
It has been only 12 hours since I was last in my bag, but here I am again for the night. Will I want to get out in the morning? No, but when I want to get up and, but I will get up and I will ski and I will be cold again. I will also think thoughts like, will my hands and feet ever be warm again? And can it snow any harder? However, I am here and I am happy for some strange reason, Robert. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a, a good kind of explanation of his, his day. Yeah. You know, uh, this triggered a memory too, and that is uh, at least once and may maybe several times in here, people have talked about the quiet, that snow absorbs sound, and it's different. And uh, so that's one thing. I think uh, maybe something else is it's hard to maybe appreciate comfort or a meal or something if you don't have any hardship, but here you've got both. Yeah. And so I think it makes that experience all the all the more poignant. Yeah. The, the quietness was one of the richest parts of the trip. Right. It was just dead quiet. Mm -hmm. No, and very few birds. Once in a while. Really, I hadn't even thought about birds. Yeah. A, a gray jay would come mm -hmm. into camp, but uh, and and virtually no animals. So. Yeah. Well, Doug, this went by too fast. I wanted to talk to you about medical emergencies and so on, but <clears throat> we're out of time. Thank you so much. That well, thank lovely. you. Lovely. And you talked about uh, reissuing this now? Or you, there were some things that you wanted to change? Or? Right, right. Yeah. So, so is it available to folks? Could well, they? Could somebody uh, get a copy? Well, there's a copy in the library okay. in McMinnville here. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> there will be a copy in the Linfield Library. Okay, great. Well, that's it, folks, uh, uh, The Writing Life. I'm Stephen W. Long, and this was so fun to read. I think you'd really enjoy it. Just stop by the library and, and pick it up. Uh, you can contact me through my website, stephenwlong.com, and I just look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much. Talk to you next time. <laughs>